and I forgot last week. I feel bad about that. Um, but we're just about through Jesus' letters to the seven churches, which really say a lot of personal stuff to us. Um, and it says that, that John was lifted up, was in the Spirit, so um, it could be that this was a visitation of Jesus to John. Because then when it, when it starts in chapter 4, uh, it, John repeats himself, he was in the Spirit, which to me indicates maybe the first part of this interaction with Jesus was actually in the cave with John, of course, in um, a spiritual, I don't know what, trance, I don't want to really call it. But it's kind of like that. That's what Daniel used to go into. Uh, it's a situation where your body is immobile, but you're here and you can think and and you you interact in your spirit with the angel or in this case Jesus. Uh, you interact with it, but you don't move. But in, in heaven, he's in the spirit and he's moving all over the place. And so we're almost through this. Um, and if I am correct, we uh, got through the church of Thyatira. And you have these churches that all have, it's interesting, if you look at that uh, one chart that I gave you uh, a while ago, if some of you don't have it, I think Roby's got some extra copies over there, the chart that gives um, the, um, yeah, who, who, yeah, Christy, who else would need, need that chart? It would list the seven churches. Some things to notice on there is, first of all, when you look at faults or grievances that Jesus has against them, he has grievances against five of the churches, two of the churches. What are their faults? None. Wouldn't you like to be part of that church? Uh, Philadelphia and Smyrna. Jesus has nothing critical to say about them. I think that's marvelous. Yes, Daryl? But Smyrna was the one that all the Christians died. Well, a lot of them were. And a lot of them were persecuted in Pergamum, too. Um, so it wasn't just Smyrna where they were persecuted, but, but they kept on in Smyrna and held to the word, and they never yielded. You see, the other five churches yielded to the influence of the world. And we, you know, we, the temptation is always there for us, isn't it? To yield to the lure of the world. Uh, Solomon almost gave up his salvation. He got so busy chasing the world. And finally at the end in Ecclesiastes, he says that, that chasing after the world was like chasing after the wind. You know, you don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it's going, you can't catch it, you can't lose it, you can't anything. You, so it's like chasing after the wind. But if you'll notice on the other five churches, this is the point I wanted to make. In every one of the five, one of the first things Jesus says is repent. Repent is a really big word in our relationship with Christ. None of us, none of us have achieved that perfection and we never will. And part of our relationship with him is the willingness to repent. Now you know David was a marvelous man of God, but he did some pretty weird and bad things, right? But the thing about David that God loved the most is David was always willing to repent. And repentance opens the door to renewing that relationship that we have with, with Christ that actually through the Holy Spirit, we're, we, who is Jesus' deposit in us, guarantees our redemption. Is that relationship thing of being willing to come to him and, and repent your shortcomings. And all five of those churches, Jesus says, repent. And that's the key thing. The other two churches didn't have to repent. If you notice, that isn't said about them. It, it's said about the other five. So um, you had Ephesus, 
that uh, compromise with the economics, got too much into the money, 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 you know, thing. And then you got um, Pergamum, they got too much into the politics. Uh, and part of the politics became hating, hating Christians. And then you've got um, uh, Thyatira that got too much into a twisted doctrine. People coming in, and we still have people in this world all over the place today that say, I'm a Christian, and then they try to sell you a false doctrine, a, do a doctrine that is not of Jesus Christ. And so uh, Thyatira had that stuff in there and had to really struggle with it. Um, we're now coming, and we're going to come up with a church of what is called Sardis. And Sardis is a church that, Sardis used to be a really important community. And there were some of these communities that were taken down in a severe earthquake. And some of them never achieved the former status that they had. And one of them was Sardis. And so Sardis ends up not being nearly as important as they used to be. And Jesus makes that reference with them because they know what he's talking about. So let's look at chapter 3. Oh, I forgot. This is so important and I'm going to go back to it. I didn't finish. I left this on purpose because I didn't want to run through it and we got to pray. <laughs> I told you I wouldn't forget the signals from the crowd had nothing to do with my memory uh, uh, Lynette I asked you I asked well of course I did I asked Nathan who are you trying what are you trying okay yeah, I'm sorry uh, Nathan will you open this please Um, if I pick it up in verse 26, um, Jesus always ends his time with every church. And notice that in every church, even churches where you say, well, you know, they're pretty liberal. They don't really follow the scriptures. You'll find people that do. And Jesus always seeks out the hearts of the people that are faithful to him, no matter where they are. So in every church, Jesus, Jesus always ends it by giving words of encouragement and promises um, to the faithful. And it's no different here in Thyatira that he, that he does this. And he says, to him who overcomes and does my will to the end, I will give him authority over the nations. Now that is a pretty heavy statement. You stop and you think about it. We are given authority over the nations. In the, in the coming new Jerusalem and the new earth, we will have authority. Now that authority will be used, of course, in, in, in the ways of goodness, in the ways of godliness, in the ways of shepherding. But that's what, that's what we'll be given. Then I want you to notice this is a wonderful thing. It describes Jesus' authority. He will rule them with an iron scepter. That means, uh, iron scepter in the Bible means absolute power. And usually that's a scary word to us humans. But in the hands of Jesus Christ, that'll be a joyful thing. But he will have absolute power. And then he will dash his enemies into pieces of pottery. Now, I want you to notice verse 28. This is a great promise. It's extremely touching. 
I will also give him, or you, I will give you the morning star. Sounds romantic, but there's a lot to it. Okay, the morning star. Go to Isaiah 16, verse 14. 14, verse 12. <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm right the second time. Verse four, chapter 14, verse 12. This is where the morning star starts. The morning, you, most all of you know that Satan at one time was in heaven. And he was a very important angel. He was called the angel of light. His name was Lucifer. But something happened in a perfect heaven. Something happened in Lucifer that twisted him. It was some sort of... Um, well, pr yeah, well, that's what it was. It was pride. It was something that corrupted his whole soul. And he began to see all this praise going over the top of his head to God. And he started wanting it. Lucifer was the morning star. And I want to tell I want to show you what that what that was and what happens here. It's beautiful. It says that in Isaiah 14, verse 12, how you have fallen from heaven. This is a prophecy about. Uh, uh, that God is giving Isaiah in the curse of Lucifer. How you have fallen from heaven, O morning star. See? Causing that. Son of the dawn. You have been cast down to earth. You who once laid low the nations. You said in your heart, I will ascend to heaven. I will ri raise my throne above the stars of God. I will sit enthroned on the mount of, of the assembly, on the most highest of the sacred mountain. And I will ascend to the tops of the clouds and I will make myself like the most high. He will make himself like God. And that's what throws him out of heaven and he loses everything he was. And he becomes this twisted serpent we call Satan. And the angels that backed him because they lusted for power were thrown out with him. And we call those today demons, fallen angels. So Satan um, lost the power of the morning star. What the morning star actually means is the morning star was, it wasn't Shekinah glory, but it, it was a representation of Shekinah glory. It was the closest thing you can come to Shekinah glory without being God. Lucifer had that authority where he could shine literally almost like God. And it was called the morning star. Well, when Jesus went to the cross, and you know he spends three days, and he gives this prophecy in the, in the Gospels where he tells his disciples, like Jonah had spent three days in the belly of a big fish, I will spend three days in the middle of the earth or the middle kingdom. And he goes down there and then the scriptures, this is where Jesus attacks the gates of hell and, and rips away from Satan all of his power, which was basically the power over sin and death. Satan could make you sin and he could kill you. Jesus now has that power over sin and death. That's why you're forgiven your sins. And that's why you have no fear of death at all. Because now that's in the hands of Jesus Christ. One well, interesting thing that it doesn't say there, but if you put it together, you connect the dots together, it works out perfectly. If you look at Revelations towards the end, Revelation towards the end, I think it's 22. At 22.17? No. Oh, 22.16. Good. Good. 22.16. And it says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. Jesus, this is at the end of Revelation. I am the root and the offspring of David. Yes, he is. And I am the bright morning star. See, Jesus took the morning star, 
the gift of light, the thing that represented to, to creation the Shekinah glory of God, okay? And he took it. Now look what he does uh, to, in, his, in his promises to Thyatira. He says, I will give you the morning star. So you talk about a wedding present, a gift to, to, let, to that will last forever. We will be given the morning star that Lucifer once controlled. Jesus took it away from him. Jesus has it. And in the end, when we are raptured and we are in heaven, he gives us as a gift that morning star, which is this glorious gift, which I, I think is so wonderful. You just put it together and it's there. It, the gift is ours. Then he goes, then we go on to the church of Sardis. Now, Sardis is one of them. You can see from that chart. Bad job that there's not much left in Sardis. And, and Jesus compares the church to the history of Sardis. You once were pretty impressive. Now you're next to nothing. They were that as a city, and now they're that as a church. And so it says two to the angel of the church of Sardis, I write, <clears throat> these are the words of him who holds the seven spirits. Now the seven spirits is the menorah, the seven uh, uh, lamps on the lampstand, the menorah, which represents the seven spirits of heaven, of Jesus Christ and of the Father and says, I hold the seven spirits. I just want you to understand, this isn't mystical. It, it's telling you, identif Jesus is identifying himself with the power of the Father Almighty. And so when Jesus speaks, he is speaking with absolute, total power and authority. And so the promises that he gives us, they are, they are, dipped in, in purity and they're dipped in absolute assuredness and it says here I know your deeds and he's talking to Sardis you have a reputation for being alive oh that's good but you're dead now that that is pretty bad I mean when somebody tells you that and especially a person of Jesus Christ, the authority of all authority. You once were alive, but now you're dead. Wake up, strengthen what remains and is about to die. In other words, whatever they have left is very frail. And Sardis doesn't have much to say about itself. And Jesus doesn't say much about it. He says, strengthen what, what remains that's about to die. For I have not found your deeds complete in the sight of my God. Now that is a church that is pretty much condemned. They, what is left is pretty much just playing the game. But there is no spirit in it. Remember, therefore, what you have received and heard. Obey, obey it and the famous repent. That's always the key to reestablishing our relationship with God and with Jesus Christ, repentance. And each and every one of us have that authority within us to turn and repent to God. You say, well, God's not gonna want me. I, I'm, I'm terrible. I've done all these bad things and, and my life's a mess and, and so I'm not even gonna try. No, no. Jesus wants you desperately, and all you have to do is seize upon the power he gave you to repent. And you repent, you come to him. Remember when Jesus went to the cross? He went to the cross once for what? For all. He went once for all. It's done. It's established. The highway is there to your freedom. All you have to do to unlock it is repent. And 
remember repent means to change and so and change and turn thank you with the, the redhead in the first row uh, um, okay remember therefore okay I've already read that but if you do not wake up I will come and you, you've heard this term lots of times when it comes to an end Jesus is going to come like what in the night? The thief. Which means basically, well, if you knew the thief was coming, what would you do? Lock the door and grab your shotgun. You see? But you don't know he's coming. And so you're, and that is it. When Jesus comes, remember, those of you that have been in my class for a while, you remember all the prophecies about Revelation. When it comes, it will come quickly, suddenly. It'll be here in a flash. And Jesus is saying, when I come, I will come like a thief in the night. You're not going to know it. And bam, it's there. So that's not going to be the time to con contemplate your life and say, well, maybe I will incorporate a few changes here and there. You know, no, it's too late. Now is the time of choice. Now is the time to turn your life around. Repent and have a new day tomorrow. And that's what Jesus is saying to um, this church. I will come like a thief, and you will not know of what time I am coming to you. Yet, and you see, Jesus knows this. Yet, you have a few people in Sardis that have not spoiled their clothes. Remember, our clothes is what identifies us. And all throughout the scriptures, the people in heaven always had what color clothes it pretty you know i think that's pretty boring you know i'd like to flare it up with a little red and green and a few other things no it's all white because that's the presence of the shekinah glory that has poured all over you you have it now we just don't probably have the spiritual sense to see it but we all are covered with the shekinah glory of god and that is why and so when he says here you have spoiled your clothes you have taken the clothes that were once yours you were given the Shekinah glory you turned your life over to Jesus and then you changed your mind and you slipped into a lot of corruption and you have dirtied your clothes see that's the symbolism that Jesus is talking about here they, and it says but he says these few people who haven't done that they will walk with me. And uh, some of you, again, I'm sorry, we got uh, a little bit of a mixed group here, but all throughout the Old Testament, and people have asked this question, how did those ancient people that were righteous, how did they know how to do the right thing? How did they know God? They didn't have the Bible. They didn't have any scriptures. They didn't, actually, nothing was written down until Moses. There was lots of people before that, and the answer is they walked with God. You look up the scripture. Enoch walked with God for 300 years. Noah walked with God. People who walked with God understood God. And that word in Hebrew, remember, was hokma, H-O-K-M-A-H. Thank you. Uh, very, well, thank you again for welcoming me. Okay, so they were, um, you walk with me dressed in white, see? No, they're not soiled. Dressed in white, for you are worthy. The honor to walk with God, to be his friend. In the Old Testament, there are only two people that actually God literally called a friend. I'm not saying he didn't have others, but... The only two he identified in the Bible, and that was Moses and Abraham. The only two he said were my friend. You know, and these and Jesus is telling you, all of you, you walk with me, you're my friend. Remember in the in the gospel where Jesus tells his disciples that you're no longer really, you're not my servants. You never have been. You're my friends. Because you basically what I'm saying is because you walk with me. Okay. He who overcomes will, uh, like them, be dressed in white, and I will never erase their name from the book of life. Now, that's a promise. 
never going to erase, erase my knee? No, as long as I am trying my best to get up off my knees and walk with God and be willing to repent for all the shortcomings I have in my life uh, and keep trying to serve him better, he will never erase my name from the book of life and he's not going to erase yours but will acknowledge his name before the Father. You know, now you stop and think about that. That's a really big deal. Don't you remember when you were a kid, you bring, when you brought somebody home to meet your parents, they were special. It just wasn't the kid in the third row and the fourth seat in your geometry class. It was somebody who, you, who was really special to you. You were proud of them. They were a very good friend. You liked them a lot. You'd bring them home and introduce them to your parents. That's what Jesus is saying. I like you a lot. I'm going to bring you home and introduce you to God. Okay, that's literally what he's saying, if you put it in that kind of language. Um, uh, I will acknowledge his name before my Father and before the angels. He who has the ear, remember? He always says this, you got ears. Are you listening? He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. Now we get to Philadelphia. So that's kind of a downer. That's kind of a downer. But there is a real lesson there. The lesson is, I don't care if you're the last person. Jesus knows you. I don't care if 99% turn against him. Well, I do. But let me make my point. The point is, if you don't turn against him, Jesus knows you. And a lot of times as humans, we're obviously we get swayed by opinion and the uh, way people think. And, you know, our society greatly influences our value system. And it, they're not always a, a good subject to follow. And we all know that. And so if you stay the course, God will always recognize you. With the Church of Philadelphia, this is the church. I mean, Smyrna too, but if I'm in Smyrna, I'm probably going to suffer and I'm allergic to pain. So I don't, would really, I would prefer Philadelphia. Philadelphia has an interesting history here. And it's one of those histories where at first you think, well, that's really bad luck. Because it isn't what you wanted to have. A perfect example of this is, you know, Jacob married two women. He got kind of tricked into it. That's another story. Rachel, who he loved, and Leah, who had his babies. And so he honored both of them and loved both of them because Leah was the mother of his children and Rachel was the love of his heart. But all, Rachel was always terribly upset her whole life because Leah kept having the babies and Rachel didn't. And then finally Rachel had Joseph, who was a marvelous man of God. But she wanted more babies and she was so, why is God cursing me? Why is God cursing me? And finally she had her second child. Benjamin died in childbirth. The whole time she was complaining she died. about not... She died. Who, yeah, what did I say? She died. She died. She died. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, so yes, she died in the second child and with the birth of the second child, Benjamin. If you stop and you think about it, all of Rachel's life she was complaining about not having children. God knew the second time she had a child she's gonna die. So God was protecting her life. He wasn't denying her, he was protecting her life. So that's the kind of thing. It's the same thing. Uh, Philadelphia didn't have much of a history in terms of time. Philadelphia wasn't established, wasn't founded until 158 B.C. Now just think roughly, 150 B.C. In 17 A.D., which is like, you know what, you may have that name, but maybe 170 years later, it has a terrible earthquake and falls apart. And so Philadelphia that started out under Roman uh, control to be a very important city. It was the most eastern, well, it and Laodicea, the most eastern cities of the seven churches. 
and it was supposed to be kind of on the frontier of Roman civilization. That was about as far as Roman true control went. And so Philadelphia was kind of on the boundary of that. So it became a very important fort city. And it also became a commercial center receiving all of the agricultural production from the western party of what, what we would today call Turkey. At that time it was called Asia Minor. So, so uh, Philadelphia had a really important role. Well, after this earthquake, it knocked the whole city down. Rome did put some money into it and rebuild some parts of it, but Philadelphia, like Sardis, never regained what it was. Picture. Up there. Oh, it is? Thank you. She's my eyes behind my head. Thank you very much, lady in the front row with the red hair. Okay. Um, now, now, Nelda, I forgot what I'm going to say. No, what I was going to say is this, is that the town was so etchy that the people who remained, which were probably only a third of its population, actually went outside the town and built their houses outside the town. And they came into the town during the day to conduct their business and everything else that functions a, a community, but then they would go out and live their life and keep their family outside the city because they, they weren't taking any chances on a bunch of stones falling on them again. And so it was kind of interesting. So because of that, Philadelphia had a very casual government. You know where the other side, like Pergamum, you had this terribly violent Roman dictator ship where they were butchering and slaughtering, murdering all these Christians. Um, uh, other, other towns that came down rich, like Smyrna, like Thyatira, came down really hard on the Christians. Philadelphia didn't because it had, its government kind of represented the way its community looked. It was just pretty casual and pretty vague and it just kind of kept the peace and kept the business going so that it would be of value to Rome and let it go with that. And its Jewish community was very small and actually kind of timid and pretty much just did their jobs and went to the synagogue and went home kept by the, and kept to themselves. So it was kind of interesting that uh, Philadelphia didn't fall into the kinds of patterns that the other the other, actually all six churches did. So um, that really was a real great break for the Christian community because they didn't have this iron fist of the Jews or and the Romans coming down on them. And uh, Philadelphia had a very healthy church. It was very godly. It was poor church. When Jerusalem had its earthquake pretty much at the same time or very shortly afterwards, Philadelphia being poor gave more support to Jerusalem than any other church. And the second place church was the church at Philippi, uh, the Philipp you know, book of the Philippians. And that was in Macedonia and they also were very poor, kind of humble. And so it tells you something that generosity doesn't have anything to do with economics, does it? It has to do with the heart. Because the people who led the way were people who we're financially humble. Okay, so now let's read about Philadelphia. And Jesus really comes out on them for, uh, in, a, in the good way. He says, these are the words of him who is holy and true, who holds the key of David. What he opens, yeah, no one can shut. What he opens, no one can shut. Isn't that a description of authority? Uh, in Job, Job in his first chapter describes God as God gives and he takes away. You can't stop him from giving and you can't stop him from taking away. You know, and um, I suppose you could say he gives life and life ends. But that's a, an example of complete authority. He opens doors, you can't shut it. He shuts the door, 
you can't open it. That's also in Isaiah 22, 22. Um, what he, okay, what he, verse 8. Yes. Yes. Oh, thank you. Um, I know your deeds. See, I have placed before you an open door that no one can shut. I know that you have little strength. See, he knows that. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. I will make those who are of the synagogue of Satan, who claim to be Jews, though they're not, they're liars, I will make them come and fall down at your feet and acknowledge that I love you. Do you remember it was Smyrna that had the synagogue of Satan? Very powerful Jewish group that persecuted the Christians terribly. And so Jesus is saying, you know that group that had all that power in Smyrna? Used to beat up the Christians all the time? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make them come over here and drop to your feet. And that's the sort of thing about evil at the end of time. Evil will drop to our feet. It has no choice. Remember, that's what it says uh, about every knee shall bow and every tongue will confess it. You don't have a choice. Now is the day. This is Jesus Christ, the Lion of Judah, the returning king. And now you drop and you have no choice. And there is no decision anymore because it's been made. So, um, 10, thank you. Um, okay, so then, oh, this is really important. This is a powerful promise. Since you have kept my command to endure patiently, I will also keep you from the hour of trial that is going to come upon the whole world to test those who are living on the earth. This is Jesus Christ. And he makes it a couple other times. There's one time in the gospel that he makes it. He tells his disciples to pray that, that they will be taken before uh, the really bad days of, of the tribulation happen. And of course, you got to remember when we think of prayer today, uh, we've changed you know, our language has twisted the meaning. So if you say you better pray about that, and you better cross your fingers and hope to God it really happens, and it's a little iffy. We got to really try, but no, to Jesus, you pray, you ask, it's given. He had the power. So when he says pray about this, he's telling you, ask, and it's yours. And so he is promising a rapture. He is promising here um, the removal of the righteous from the earth before things get violent. And, and then it says in 11, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have. Remember this? Remember, um, stand your ground. Yeah, in church, stand your ground. Hold what you have. Don't give it away. You know, Sardis gave it away. A lot of these other people in the other churches, they gave it away. They didn't have to, but they did. And Jesus is saying, hold on to what you have so that no one will take your crown. Him who overcomes, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God. And this is where that statement comes from. I think most of you have heard all oh, their pillars of the church. You know, sort of thing. Well, this is where it comes from. And, of course, it comes from for one obvious reason and then one really not all that obvious. And that is, the obvious one is, of course, pillars do what? They hold the church up. They hold the roof up. And the other one, and um, Becca, this is, I think it's uh, four or so. It's where you have the solitary... A pillar column um, I think go back yeah there you go very good thank you see that pillar that pillar is um, standing I'm sorry standing from the church of um, Diana or Artemis it depends on which language you use 
um, in Ephesus, that temple of Diana, and and you notice the only thing the only thing that's standing of that temple is still one of the pillars. It's been standing there like for 2,300 years. It's been standing there, and you see part of one over here. That's all that's left of that. Is that the pillars not only hold the church up or the building up, but also they're about the last thing to give in. And so that's what he's telling them to, to, to do, to be. To hold the church up, to hold the people up, and be the last to give in. And in other words, don't. Pillar of the temple. Never again will he leave it. I will write on him the name of, of my God. In other words, Jesus is going to make sure everything in existence knows who you belong to. That's what baptism is all about. Remember? Baptism is about making a public statement of who you are and who you belong to. And Jesus is going to put the name of God on you so everybody knows who you are and who you belong to. And the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, where you live. Um, which is coming down out of the heaven. And you'll see this like in... 22 um, uh, of Revelation when it ends and, and John literally sees the new world, the new eternal world of the new earth and the new Jerusalem coming down and forming over the old and uh, the last the life everlasting beginning. He sees this. Uh, the new Jerusalem which is coming down out of heaven from my God and I will also write on him my new name. Jesus is going to give you a new name. Remember he gave a new name to Peter. He gave a new name to two or three of his disciples. Um, it's not unheard of. Uh, Jesus is going to give every single one of us a new name and that name will reflect who you are. The name we have now is a label. Nathan. Jesus is saying, who will? Oh, that he will have a new name? Him, my new name or the name of name. I see I see what you're saying my new name I think you're right the question was is is Jesus saying here that he will give you a new name or he will write on you and I think you're right there's another place where he says he will give us a, a new name and I picked that up but you're right here it says or I will write on him my new name thank you um, he who has an ear again let him hear what the Spirit has to say to the churches. Um, now we have the church of Laodicea. Interesting case. Laodicea is way out there by where Philadelphia was. And it's a direct contrast with Philadelphia. Philadelphia was disorganized and poor and only served kind of workman type functions like bringing in all the grain from the west and transferring it into the east and things like this where <clears throat> Laodicea was a banking center you had lots and lots of gold all over the place it was also a manufacturing center remember where Thyatira was a textile a center Laodicea was a center for winter clothes it had the finest black wool known. In fact, still today, I have a picture of Laodicea, um, ruins of it, with sheep feeding in between the columns and everything. It still is prime land for herding sheep. And um, it also was a medical center and developed a salve that was very soothing to eye diseases. 
and it, something else I'm forgetting, but I'll get it when we go through it. Um, and this is to, Laodicea was a church like Ephesus. It was Ephesus and Laodicea were without a doubt the two prosperous cities in the eastern section of the Roman Empire. And um, like the church at Ephesus, uh, the Laodiceans had a lot of temptations and they gave in to them. They gave in to them, they made an enormous, in fact, they made so many compromises with the uh, surrounding world, Jesus saw little benefit in, the, in their Christian life. And that's really sad because this is a perfect example of the difference in how God sees us and how the world sees us. Complete contrast. These are the words of the Amen. Uh, and you know the word Amen means uh, let it be. So be it. So be it. Uh, and Jesus is using that name for himself here. The faithful and the true witness, the ruler of God's creation. That's Jesus. I know your deeds, that you are neither hot nor cold. I said cold or hot. I wish you were either one or the other. Uh, so because you are lukewarm, neither hot nor cold, I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. See, this is a reference to water. Laodicea had its water come in from the mountains, which most of those cities did. But Laodicea was farther away from its mountain reservoir of water than most all the other cities. So by the time the water got to Laodicea, it was lukewarm. warm. It had a lot of minerals in it, so it tasted bad. So they were very famous for bad water. You know, it was very drinkable, but it wasn't fun to drink. And you see, if you think about water, cold water is very refreshing. Hot water is very therapeutic. And so if you're hot or you're cold, you're a blessing to people. But if you're lukewarm, you're nothing. And that's what Jesus is saying. You're, you're spiritually, you guys are nothing. And I'm about to spit you out of my mouth. You say, I am rich. Well, they were. I have acquired wealth, and I do not need a thing. But you do not realize that you are wretched, pitiful, poor, blind, and naked. See, these people saw their wealth in material things. Remember, how many times in the Bible does it say, why do you put all your trust in material wealth when a thief can come in the night and take it? Or, you know, uh, Peter says, don't put your faith in things that can rust or corrode or, or be stolen. You know? And that's what Jesus is saying. You put all, you, the thing is, is basically you own wealth or does it own you? Good question, isn't it? Do you, do, you, do you own wealth or does your wealth own you? And that's the basic question here. Um, and, and he says, you know, you don't realize that you are pitiful, poor. Remember um, um, Smyrna, where it said, you, everybody thinks you're poor, but you're really rich. So you see, God sees it completely different. They were rich spiritually, poor in terms of material uh, possessions. And Laodicea is the opposite. They're poor and wretched spiritually. And then it says blind. Well, remember I told you they had a salve? So they understand that because they get people with, that come journey to their place with eye diseases that have semi-blinded them to get the salve to get healed. And Jesus is saying, you've got salve that you think heals blindness, but you can't heal your own blindness. Because your own blindness is spiritual blindness. And naked, there's nothing worse than being naked in the cold. And remember, Laodicea was famous for its, its winter garments. They were highly, prayed, highly prized, the winter garments of... Um, Laodicea, and, and yet Jesus says, yeah, you got those garments, but you're naked. And because Jesus sees things totally different from our world. 
And it says, um, oh, and then he says, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire so that you can become rich. Hey, we're rich. We got gold all over the place. But they also knew that not all gold was pure. Because if it wasn't burned at the right temperatures, and if it wasn't refined properly, um, it would have impurities in it. And so Jesus is saying, hey, get some of my gold, because my gold is pure. Because you remember the fire of God does three things. Depends on which side you're on. One side is the fire of God destroys. And the fire of God brings damnation the lake of fire but the fire of God also brings purification in uh, Zechariah I believe 11 could be 12 um, uh, in Zechariah they have the appearance of Jesus who comes and this is a vision of Zechariah and the, uh, an appearance of Jesus comes to them and it says that of the Jews Two-thirds of you will be destroyed. Hmm? Oh, but one-third, Jesus says, I will bring into the fire. And I will refine you like silver. And I will purify you like gold. And all of your impurities will be gone. And that's what Jesus is saying. You guys are, are chasing after the wrong gold because your gold isn't perfect. My gold is. And so he says, uh, and then he goes into the clothing. He says, and I will give you white clothes to wear. We know what that is. So that you can cover your shamefulness, I'm sorry, your shameful nakedness, and I talked about, and salve to put on your eyes so you can see. See, he takes everything that they took pride in and he reduces it to nothing. And then he says, here's what's valuable. That ought to get their attention. Those whom I love, I rebuke and discipline. So be earnest and repent. There it is again. Repent. And then here's one of the most famous ones Jesus says. Here I am. I stand at the door and knock. And if... So anyone hears my voice and comes to the door, I will come in and eat with them. Remember how bonding that is. With him and him with me. There's um, scriptures in, in Matthew 7-7. Yeah, seven, seven. Matthew 7-7 seven, seven, where there's this famous saying, most of you probably have heard of it, where uh, Jesus tells them, ask and you will receive um, knock and the door will be open. Seek. To ask. Ask, knock, and seek. Seek, thank you. Thank you. Again. Uh, uh, yeah, ask, seek, and knock. And so you see, those are active words. And on this case, Jesus is saying, I'm on the inside of the door, but if you knock, I'll open it. But in this case, he's saying, I'm on the outside of the door. I'm just going to knock. I'm not going to blow the door away. I'm not going to kick it in. You have your choice. You can accept me or not. I'll knock at your door, though, to make sure you have that choice. You receive it or you don't. And I believe every human being somehow has that opportunity to turn that way. And um, we're given that opportunity. Okay, so the last, the last verse here. To him who overcomes, I will give the right to sit with me on my throne. Now remember, sit on a throne, you are in authority. You're in power. People who are in power sit. You know, if you've ever been in a courtroom, everybody stands until who sits down. Judge. You know, and then you get to sit down. Just as I overcame and sat down with my father on my throne. And again, if you got air, you better hear what the Spirit has to say. Now that's the, um, that's the um, letters to the seven churches. And there's a lot to learn there because there's a lot 
of promises Jesus makes that's our future in heaven in all those seven churches. Now John begins his tour of heaven. And of course he starts at the most obvious place. He starts in the temple, in the throne room of God. He says, I'm standing there and a door opens. Well, who can open a door no one can shut? So Jesus opened, you know, who, who can walk into the temple of God? Well, the covering of blood, Jesus' blood, we all can. But here's John, and he's walking into the temple of God because of the authority of Jesus Christ who opens the door for him. And so that's the way this starts. And now the trip begins. Now the trip begins, and the things you're going to see are going to be amazing. And so just hang in there with me. We'll see it together. Um, George, could you close this, please, in a moment of prayer? Father God, we just uh, look through the words you say. Exciting. Oh, by the way, <clears throat> I made some copies of Polycarp's writings. Remember I said he almost made the Bible. Uh, the bishop from Smyrna that died for Jesus. Um, I've got some copies up here of his works, about eight pages of reading. If any of you, um, how many do you have left? Oh, okay, what well, number of you got them? There's three more copies left if any of you want to take a copy and read what Bart and Polycarp had to say. Pretty good stuff. Pretty good stuff. Remember, something, if you don't make the Bible, it's not that you'd had a bad writing. It's because it is not confirmed that, you, that the writing is absolutely perfect. If any part of it is not confirmed, it doesn't make the Bible. So there's a number of good righteous writing, I think Polycarp's one of them, that didn't make the Bible. It's good stuff. Thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it a lot. Girls?